All right, everyone, um, let's get started. Sorry for the technical difficulties here. It's a pleasure today to have Ovik Roy from the uh, Foundation for Research on Equal Opportunity joining us talking about his uh, healthcare work. Just a way of introduction, Ovik is a scientist, an investment analyst, a journalist, and policy advisor. <laughs> so he co he's the co-founder and president of the Foundation for Research on Equal Opportunity, a think tank based here in Austin that focuses on expanding economic opportunities to those who need the most. Um, he has been, unfortunately, no, not unfortunately, so he has been the advisor for unfortunately unsuccessful three Republican presidential candidates. Depends on and your point of view. <laughs> <laughs> and he's also the policy editor for Forbes magazine. So, Ovik, thanks for, for joining us. And uh, go ahead. Thank you. And um, again, apologies, got, uh, took a bit to get the computer going. So I hope you had your coffee today, because I'm going to have a lot of charts. So anyone who's not OK with charts, just, um, you know, Tell me, and you can, you can just raise your hand and say, enough with the charts, and we can pause and talk or something. Um, well, as you can see, the, the title of my talk is The Conservative Case for Universal Coverage. And um, it really, my work in healthcare is what's driven me to be involved in a lot of other areas uh, along the same line. So why, so why FreeUp? Why did we start this think tank called FreeUp, the Foundation for Research on Equal Opportunity, two and a half years ago? Why did we do that? Why did we go through all the trouble? Some people ask me, you know, particularly when we're getting started, you know, does, does the world really need another think tank? Obviously, you know, I, I, I was partial to the idea, but let me explain why. So our mission, as Carlos mentioned, is to expand economic opportunity to those who least have it. But here's the key element of what makes what we do different than pretty much every other think tank that's out there from our point of view. And that is that we live in a time that, if you go by the conventional wisdom, is hopelessly divided. Right? We don't agree on anything. We're always yelling at each other. And if you watch cable news all the time, you could certainly be convinced of that. Our assessment is the exact opposite. Our assessment is that 80% of Americans actually agree on what America should stand for. We might disagree on the particulars, but almost all of us want every American to have a fair shot at success. We want an America in which, regardless of where you were born, where your parents were born, how much your parents make, how much you make, what side of the tracks you're born on, that everyone can achieve his or her dreams, and that those elements of economic uh, and national origin are not barriers to your success. And yet we, we do, of course, have certain disagreements about how exactly to achieve economic opportunity, equal economic opportunity. But that's a discussion about evidence. That's not a discussion of first principles. And if you can actually agree on first principles, then that's the role of a think tank or a research institution, <coughs> is, to do, is to study the evidence and identify ways in which uh, policies can be improved so that we can achieve economic opportunity for every American, that principle that we all agree on. And so we actually contend that it's possible to advance conservative and progressive principles at the same time. Not to compromise between them, but to advance policies that progressives can genuinely believe are, are an extension of progressive values, and conservatives can genuinely believe are an extension of conservative values. Now, I know this sounds like you know, uh, mad science nuclear fusion talk, uh, but bear with me. So what, what strategically do we do to try to achieve both progressive and conservative values at the same time? We focus on market-based reforms that meaningfully improve policy outcomes, economic outcomes, the lives of Americans who are in the bottom half of the economic ladder. So anyone who's a true, true blue believing capitalist knows or believes that free markets have lifted a lot of people out of poverty around the world. A billion, if you, if you listen to Arthur Brooks, if you talked about India and China, but even in America, free markets, if, if, if free markets done the right way, lift people out of poverty. And so let's show that. Our work is to basically say, OK, if free marketeers believe that, then, then let's exclusively focus on this kind of work. Let's only find ways in which we can reform the way markets work, the way technological innovation works, uh, the way free enterprise works, so that it can serve those on the bottom half of the economic ladder. Because we would argue that if free markets can't show that, then they don't deserve the public support. Uh, that they've had historically. 
and our structure is we're a traditional think tank, nonpartisan, nonprofit, funded by charitable donations. This is a picture of a, a, a debate that I was having, hosted by Peter Robinson of Stanford. And this guy in the beard here is an eminent conservative thinker named John Podhoretz. His father was the founder or co-founder of the neoconservative movement in the 1960s. He's the uh, editor of Commentary, a leading conservative uh, journal. And we're having this discussion in 2017. While uh, Republicans have just won the election in 2016, they control both the White House and Congress, and they've produced this repeal and replace Obamacare bill, which, as you know, got a lot of criticism from the left as taking health insurance away from tens of millions of Americans. Uh, but the criticism on the right was actually different. The criticism of the Republican bills to repeal and replace Obamacare from the right was not that it took health insurance away from people, but that it did too much to subsidize health insurance for the uninsured. John Podhoretz said in our conversation uh, that Republicans have accepted the idea that there should be universal health coverage in the United States, and that was never a conservative or Republican goal. The fact that Republicans are actually striving at all to help the uninsured afford health insurance means that we have accepted an essential social democratic principle, and this is a philosophical surrender, a moral surrender of what conservatism stands for. This is what John Podhoretz said in this uh, particular debate that he and I had. And if you want to hear my response, you can go on YouTube and you can find the whole thing. But I'm just going to show you a chart. <laughs> so this table actually is a table, I guess, not a chart, right? But this table is from the Heritage Foundation, which is one of the leading conservative think tanks in America. They would say they're the leading conservative think tank in America. And they every year do something actually really cool. They rank every single country in the world on economic freedom. And the 2019 one just came out a couple months ago. And the US ranked 12th uh, behind Taiwan, Iceland, the UAE, a bunch of other countries. Now, here's something interesting about, about this ranking which again comes from an un, a place of unimpeachable conservative credentials. Every single one of these countries except the UAE has universal coverage. So you hear people say, you hear John Port Horowitz say, well, if, America, if everyone in America has health insurance, then we've surrendered. We're no longer a free country. And yet, 10 out of the 11 countries that are more economically free than the United States have universal health insurance. Why is that? How is that? And what can we learn, if anything, from some of the countries that are above here on the list? And I'm not trying to argue that the UK is a model for, for the US in terms of having a market-based healthcare system. We all know that the UK has a very government-oriented healthcare system. Canada, similarly, there's really no meaningful role for private health insurance in Canada. Those are examples of single-payer systems, the kind that Bernie Sanders loves. But there are some countries up here, particularly Switzerland and Singapore, that have more market-oriented systems in the US. So you'll hear a lot of Americans say, no, we have the best healthcare system in the world, we have the most market-based healthcare system in the world. No, actually, we don't. We neither have the best healthcare system in the world nor the most market-based healthcare system in the world. And we're gonna talk about a lot of that today. And a key part of this is this concept. So a lot of people say, well, America has a market-based healthcare system and the rest of the world uh, does not. The rest of the world has single payer. And so if you're on the left, you might think we should be more like Europe. If you think on the right, you might think we might be, want to be less like Europe. But it's actually not true that the rest of Europe has single-payer health insurance. They all have universal health insurance systems, but some of those systems involve private insurance. Some involve government insurance. Some are a mix of public and private insurance like the United States. So there's actually a lot we can learn by thinking about all the diverse ways in which Europeans have tried to tackle the problem of health insurance. And some of those models are actually more market oriented, oriented than the United States. This is the most important chart, and this is actually a chart that I'm going to show you today. When I first put this together, it blew my mind. Now, I know these numbers are small, and you may not be able to read them in the back of the room. But what this chart is showing you is government expenditures per capita in the industrialized world, not total health expenditures. You've all seen the chart where, you know, the U.S. is spending 18% of GDP on health care, and that's more than every other country, blah, 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 blah. This is not that chart. This is a chart comparing government spending on health care across the industrialized world. And here's the thing that 
that blows my mind that American government spending on health care per capita was higher than all but four countries in the world in 2013, the year before Obamacare went into effect. Think about that for a second. Think of how inefficient our health care system has to be that we spend more than almost every other country in the world on government health care. And yet, there were 50 million people who were uninsured in America. Think of how extremely inefficient of a health care system we must have. And so when Bernie Sanders says, yes, we should be more like Canada and the UK, um, and the right and the Republicans say, well, we can't afford to have you know, the Canadian health care system, Bernie has a point. Because actually, Canada covers everybody, and they spend less per capita than we spend. You're raising your hand. Go ahead. I think there's a, a gap in the logic that it would be really great if you could fill in for me. You, so you claim that this chart shows that our government spending on our government spending is very inefficient, but this doesn't try and control for quality. So, like, there's this well-known fact that the United States spends an immense amount of money in government spending even, mostly, on trying to save very premature babies that many other countries do not. And so how do I know that this, these differences reflect differences in quality as opposed to differences, or sorry, differences in inefficiency as opposed to differences in quality? We also spend much more on long-term care as well. Okay, stay tuned. <laughs> okay. So when Republicans start criticizing uh, the, Repub uh, the, the, the Affordable Care Act, which was built on top of this system, right? That last chart was from 2013. The Affordable Care Act really kicks in in 2014. You know, they have a point. I think everyone agrees, it's either a feature or a bug, depending on your point of view, that Obamacare expands the role of the government in our healthcare system. Paul Ryan and others called it the government takeover of the healthcare system. And one way to measure the expansion of the role of government in the Affordable Care Act is how much more on healthcare the ACA spends, right? So when it's up and running fully, roughly speaking, the ACA will spend about $200 billion a year covering the uninsured. And that's real money even in Washington. Think about it this way. The, the Defense Department, the defense budget is about $800 billion a year. So we're spending a quarter of the defense budget trying to cover the uninsured. That's a pretty significant effort to cover the uninsured, right? I think we can all agree. Now, in fairness to the ACA, the, the Affordable Care Act did cut spending on Medicare to partially fund this expansion of coverage. It also funds it through tax increases, but, but there is a spending cut involved in med, uh, to offset, partially offset, the spending on the uninsured. So if you net that out, it's more like $75 billion a year, so still real money. Um, but now we should ask the question of how much uh, were we spending on health care before Obamacare, right? The question we talked about in the last chart. And that's going to be in these red bars. So uh, they didn't give us multiple stories of the building to pr present the slide, so I will compress it for you. So the blue bars here are what Paul Ryan called the government takeover of the healthcare system. What's the red? That was the real government takeover of the healthcare system that happened thanks to that guy who's got the museum over there, uh, LBJ, <laughs> Medicare and Medicaid. That's what's driving uh, healthcare spending in America. That's what's driving our debt and deficit, as we'll see in a minute. Uh, we can argue all we want about repealing and replacing Obamacare. We will have done absolutely nothing to solve the actual problem, uh, the actual fiscal problem in our healthcare system. So if you're the kind of person who's concerned about the fact that our healthcare system is too expensive from a fiscal standpoint, we're spending too much on it, well, <laughs> Obamacare is not going to affect that. It's this piece of the puzzle that you have to tackle. You have to tackle the broader cost of health care, the broader subsidies, uh, the broader system uh, that, that uh, a lot of Republicans tend to ignore. Why? You know, who do old people vote for in this country? Republicans, right? So is it any surprise that Republicans are not that excited about reforming Medicare? Um, so here's another way to look at this. It's not just the 80-20. It's the, basically the hundred zero of our fiscal situation in America that the growth in federal spending on health care is driving our deficit and debt. I've, uh, I've taken the Congressional Budget Office's official projections of future spending going forward 75 years. Now, 
75 year projections are full of errors and uncertainties and you know that's all you know, that's all to be with a, to be given but um, they have to base their projections on current law so the way to think about this chart is imagine the laws that are on the books today stay the laws on the books for the next 75 years what kind of spending is the federal government obligated to spend based on the laws that are on the books today and as a share of our economic output it's only health care that's growing. In this blue section of the chart is everything else. The defense budget, social security, highways, everything else you think the federal government should be spending or should not be spending money on, with one exception, interest on the federal debt. All right, so we're never going to get to 2050 in this chart because um, the credit card company of the United States, which is the people who buy treasury bonds, mainly China, are not going to sit around and wait for us to just not solve this problem. And if they decide to spy fewer treasury bonds, i.e. pull the credit card from, uh, from the federal government, this interest spending is going to climb because the interest rate is going to climb. So we're never going to get to 2050 on this chart. And guess what? If China and other countries that buy our debt stop, stop buying it and we have to slash federal health care spending, in order to solve this problem, who's going to be affected? Not wealthy people who can afford to buy private coverage. It's going to be the people who depend on federal assistance to afford their health insurance. The elderly, the sick, the vulnerable, the poor, the disabled. Those are the people who are going to be adversely affected if we do nothing about this problem. So what are the components of spending on health care, both federal and otherwise? Well. Number one is hospitals. Uh, most universities today, and the University of Texas is not exempted from this, are basically like hospital systems with a couple classrooms attached in terms of the economics of the university. It's academic medical centers in large part that are the biggest regional monopolies and charging the highest prices. Doctors are the second biggest chunk, prescription drugs the third, and a grab bag of stuck stuff is everything else. But you'll hear, you'll, you know, the great thing about healthcare is we're really good at blaming the other guys, right? So the hospitals say, it's not our fault, it's the drug companies. The drug companies say, it's not our fault, the doctors write the prescriptions. The doctors say, it's not our fault, it's the lawyers, right? Everybody has somebody else to blame. I hate to break it to you, but everybody is to blame. Here's the amazing thing. We got a question earlier about quality. Well, one way to measure quality in terms of efficiency is how good are we at getting people in and out of the hospital. The longer you're in the hospital, the more your episode of care costs, and also the more bad things can happen to you, right? You can get an infection from the air conditioner, uh, for example. Well, it turns out, compared to all those other countries, we're actually way on the left end. We're actually two days better on average than your average industrialized country at at the length of stay for a comparable episode of care in a U.S. hospital. So that should mean healthcare in America is cheaper, right? It's two days shorter. It's 25 percent shorter the average hospital stay. I don't know what they're doing in Japan. I guess the sushi must be really good. I don't know. I wouldn't want to have sushi in a Japanese hospital probably. But uh, think about that. Healthcare should be cheaper in America, right? We're, it, we're more efficient than the average European country at getting people out of the hospital. But here's the amazing thing. The amount we spend per day in an American hospital is 5x what it is in our peer countries. And that's not, by the way, because we're doing five times as much stuff to the patient. It's because the MRI costs five times as much. The respirator that is charged, the hospital charges five times as much for the respirator. Everybody in the, who's working in the hospital makes more money than they would make at another, uh, in another country's institution. So this is the key thing. It's the unit price of healthcare in America that's so much higher than it is elsewhere, not utilization of more services. Here's a, a chart I put together recently that really blew my mind when I had to recalculate it three times because I was convinced this couldn't be right. The average tax rate for the average household in America in 2019 is going to be 13.5% thanks to the recent tax uh, law changes that were passed in 2017. The average household's share of national health uh, hospital spending is 15 percent of their income. In other words, the average family is spending more of their income on hospital care, either directly or through insurance premiums or through taxes for other people's hospital care, 
than they're sending to the IRS in taxes. How crazy is that? We live in a system where your local hospital is more powerful in your life than the IRS. That is how significant the high cost of health care is in America. And again, it's not because the hospitals in America are doing five times as much stuff or more stuff to you. Right? It's also physician care. The average physician visit in America is three times to five times more expensive than a physician visit in other countries. And you all know that drugs in America are more expensive than they are elsewhere. And again, it's not because the drugs are better in America. We're talking about exactly the same drugs. The molecules are exactly the same. They're just more expensive in the United States. Why is that? And by the way, to get back to the issue of efficiency and quality, here's something that's really remarkable. America is better than every other country in the world at substituting cheap, unbranded generic drugs off patent for branded drugs. We're actually better than all these European countries, and yet we still spend more on drugs than every other country in the world. Think about this. The amount of money we've spent on generic drugs has actually declined even though their share has gone up. But the amount we spend on branded drugs has gone up 50% in the last five years where we have data. 50%. It's not because the drugs are 50% better. It's because the prices are 50% better, right? So how do we get here? OK, I'm going to pause from all the charts, or at least the number, part, number type charts, and I'll give you a picture of how the healthcare system went from these Nice old colonial buildings like the ones at Mass General Hospital where people just kind of went to visit your house and kind of met, you know, to listen to what you had to say and, you know, all that and into this, into this uh, planet destroying system we have today. Uh, we can start let's, start, let's start in 1965. So in 1965, uh, LBJ and his, and his friends were, were, were fighting for national, a national health insurance system. And the AMA was resisting because the AMA, the American Medical Association, said, no, you know, uh, if the federal government runs our health care system, they'll tell us how to practice medicine. We think that's really terrible. They shouldn't do that. So LBJ, as we say in Texas, was a crafty SOB. And uh, he came up with an idea. He said, OK, AMA, I'm tired of you fighting all these national health insurance plans. Here's, what I'm gonna, here's the deal I'm going to offer you. We're going to let you charge whatever you want to your patients if you just shut up about my Medicare bill. <laughs> and the AMA said, yes, OK, we'll shut up. And Medicare passed. Well, that was great for LBJ. That's why you know he has a presidential library and, and lots of cool stuff in it. Uh, and that's also why doctors uh, make a lot of money, because consumers, patients, became like me in an open bar at an in-law's wedding, <laughs> where, you know, I, you know, if it's a cash bar, I'm, I'm going to have like, I'm not going to have even like the thirsty goat. I'm going to have the Bud Light, right? <laughs> But if it's the in-law's wedding, then it's going to be uh, bourbon all the way. And that's basically our health care system. Our health care system, Medicare and Medicaid turned our health care system or amplified things about our pre-existing health care system that make it a $3 trillion open bar. Because when you make health insurance free for people, and you know, like there was a real need, right? Seniors were, having, uh, were struggling to afford their health insurance and their health care, same with the very poor. So it's not like there wasn't merit behind the idea of what Medicare and Medicaid were, obviously. But when you make consumers insensitive to health costs, what happens? The doctors and the hospitals and the drug companies are like the bourbon makers in, in my open bar analogy, right? They can charge whatever they want because of the deal with LBJ and know that the, the taxpayers are going to be on the hook for whatever they charge. It's a really great system if you are a doctor or a hospital or a drug company. So what happens? Hospitals raise their prices and build new buildings. Why are most hospitals in America really ugly? Because they were all built in the 1960s when architects were like, at their artistic nadir in Western civilization. <laughs> so you, all these hospitals get built. The bean counters wake up and say, wait a minute, we're spending way too much on healthcare. How did that happen? And here's a trivia point for you. In 1965, when Medicare was being considered by Congress, uh, the government projected that in 1990, in inflation-adjusted dollars, we'd be spending $10 billion a year on Medicare. <laughs> the real number was $110 billion. And now we're at 800 billion careening towards a trillion. Well, what did they get wrong? They didn't understand the open bar problem of the way they'd structured Medicare and Medicaid. So of course, once you're spending more than expected, you're not going to kick the seniors off Medicare. We all know you, you can't do that. 
So what did the government do instead? The government hired a bad cop called insurance companies to basically say no to the patient instead of government so the politicians could get off scot-free and all the blame would be on the insurance companies. And the government would was started to gradually reduce the growth rates of what they were paying hospitals and doctors in order to, um, uh, and in order to keep costs down. So hospitals, of course, weren't so thrilled about this. They couldn't tell the government what to do, but they could tell private insurers what to do in the rest of the market. So they started to merge to create regional monopolies so that if you have private insurance, you couldn't use hospitals against each other to negotiate for lower prices. And so hospitals and drug companies started raising prices uh, and therefore charging more money to private insurers who are paying most of the bills. And since private insurers aren't in the habit of going bankrupt, they pass those higher costs on to consumers in the form of higher premiums, which led us to wake up in the 2000s and say, you know, it's terrible that tens of millions of Americans can't afford their health insurance. And so we came up with the brilliant solution of subsidizing health insurance for more people. Now, this is not to say that we shouldn't make sure that every American has health insurance. As you know, the title of this talk is The Conservative Case for Universal Health Insurance. But it's that the particular way we've done it in the United States is a complete disaster. It's the worst of both worlds in which we subsidize health insurance for almost everybody, wealthy or poor, healthy or sick, but do so in a way in which there's the maximum incentive to drive up the price and waste in uh, the supply and delivery of health care. Before you go on, I just want to Go ahead. Well, it goes, it goes back further than that. So actually, it's uh, wage controls in World War II that actually uh, created this whole problem. Basically, what happened is all the men went off to war. FDR was really worried about a labor shortage. And so they literally enacted a schedule of what everyone could get paid. Your barber could only get paid this. Your mechanic could only get paid that. But they forgot to include health benefits in the wage schedule. So employers started to compete with each other, not by raising wages, because they couldn't, but by offering more and more generous health insurance packages. And then after the war, you'd think all these things would go away. The wage controls did go away. But the Eisenhower administration, a little known uh, development uh, issued by the a regulation, a rule issued by the IRS, said, we're going to exempt from taxation uh, employer-based health insurance. And that is what led to the massive inflation of you know, the open bar problem. You know, it started really back then. But Medicare was built on that. So Medicare basically said, we're going to have a health insurance plan that's modeled after what people get in the employer market. It was a way of saying, hey, everybody who might be skeptical of Medicare, we're doing it the way the private sector does. right?" So that's how we got to where we are today. But of course, we fixed all this in 2010 when we passed Obamacare. Remember that? We, we, we solved everything. Um, so let's talk about some of the things that actually we, we didn't solve in the ACA. And frankly, the ACA didn't try, try to solve. Actually, in certain ways, the ACA made some of these things worse. One of them is the increasing con concentration of the hospital market. So economists use something called the Herfindahl-Hirschman Index to measure market concentration. For those who really care, it's the sum of the squares of the market shares in a given market. So if you're a monopoly, 100 squared is 10,000. That's like a perfect score in the HHI logarithm. Uh, and the FTC and the DOJ look start in, in the rest of the economy, if a merger leads to an HHI greater than 2,500, that's when they start to litigate and try to sue on antitrust grounds to try to block that merger from taking place. Here's something amazing. The average hospital in a hospital region in America has an HHI greater than 2,500. In other words, almost every merger between two hospitals that's happening in America should be getting blocked on antitrust grounds but they're not getting blocked. And all the research shows that basically, you know, when, when two hospitals merge, which you'll hear the CEO say is, well, you know, we're going to merge and we're going to have this integrated system and we're going to share all this data and the patients are going to do really great. Well, the academic research shows that there's basically no effect on health outcomes as hospitals merge together. In fact, there are some studies that show that hospital outcomes get worse. They're actually diseconomies of scale because of more bureaucracy and higher costs. 
So while quality may not actually get better, we know that there's something that does get a lot better, and that's pricing power. So an economist at the University of California named Jamie Robinson did this elegant study a few years ago where he split the, uh, the US, the, all the hospital markets in the US into two buckets. The blue bucket in this chart are, is the more competitive bucket. So people, uh, hospitals in regions where the HHI was below the median of 2510. And then the second bucket, which will be the red bucket, were hospitals that were the more, co more concentrated markets, where the HHI was higher than 2510. And for six common procedures like pacemaker insertions, angioplasty, knee replacements, hip replacements, what did he find? The prices were 44% higher on average, but the underlying costs were the same. If, in fact, in the competitive markets, the costs were slightly lower. Why? It's totally understandable, right? In a competitive market where there's price competition, you also try to be optimistic or optimize on costs because you know that's a good way to keep your prices down. In a monopoly, you don't have to keep prices down because you can charge whatever you want, right? So the payroll goes up. You're not disciplined about keeping your costs efficient. You don't have to. And by the way, again, this is not, I don't want mean to pick on only hospitals. This is true throughout the healthcare system. Here's an example from drugs. So one of the ways in which drug companies are, have figured out how to charge the highest price and get the maximum returns is you study ultra-rare diseases where the barriers and the R&D costs and the regulatory barriers are very low. Because if you have a disease that only 4,000 Americans have, the FDA is like, go to town. Like, you know, it's not going to be a big public health problem if your drug doesn't work. So you know, you can only, you, you'd only have to do a small clinical trial. It's not that big of a deal. So for those drugs, the cost of getting those drugs to market are very low, but you can charge whatever you want because uh, in, in, a, in a really strange kind of, you know, uh, strange circumstance, we basically said it's okay for uh, or so-called orphan drug developers to charge really high prices in order to uh, make up for their, the, the fact that their, their markets are small. Well, what's happened? In 2015, orphan drugs, drugs treating diseases that had fewer than 200,000 patients in America, we're a quarter of all drug spending. They're going to be a third of all drug spending in 2020, $176 billion, right? So that's where a lot of the growth is. And by the way, remember the Affordable Care Act was supposed to actually make health care more affordable? Well, uh, enrollment in the AC exchanges was predicted by the Congressional Budget Office in 2019 to be with 25 million people. They had to downgrade that to 19 million in 2016, and then Today, it's $9 million. Why is that? So yes, the CACA has expanded coverage, but why is it so much lower than what the CBO originally projected? It's because the premiums are double what they were five years ago or six years ago before the ACA uh, launched. So what the ACA was supposed to do was to make health insurance less expensive for people who were the most affected by its insurance regulations that made insurance more expensive. And yes, some of those people benefit from the subsidies for coverage, uh, but those people tend to be at the lowest end of the economic spectrum, as you will see here. So this, what this chart is showing you is your, your, the, the percentage of people who are eligible for ACA subsidies, what percentage of them are enrolling. So if you're at the poverty line or at 150, below 150% of the federal poverty line, about 80% of people who are in that bracket are signing up for coverage on the ACA exchanges because their premiums are mostly paid for by the subsidies. But the subsidies phase out as your income goes up. And you can see the linear drop off here as your income goes up. If you're making $30,000 a year, $40,000 a year, most people in that bracket are not, are not able to afford the coverage that the ACA has brought to market because it's so expensive. Imagine like if every car were an electric car in America. We might think that's good for the environment, but the cars would be more expensive, at least today. Maybe someday they won't be, but today they would be. So fewer people would be able to afford a new car. Same is true with health insurance. If you make insurers cover all these extra things, the insurance is going to be more expensive. That's what's happened with the ACA. I know there was a question back there. Go ahead. Yeah, so on that, that last chart, you start at 100. Yep. One of the things that I think makes your case even stronger is the fact that part of the problem is the failure to expand Medicaid in all states. So what you have is people who make less than 100 actually have lower um, enrollment because they can't, in a, in a non medicaid yeah, it depends on the state, obviously, and it depends on exactly how the Medicaid eligibility role, rules are in that state. But in Texas, for example, if you're an able-bodied uh, individual, you can, you can, you're able to work and you, and you don't, 
Um, you're not eligible for Medicaid, basically, unless you're very, very poor, unless your income is basically close to zero. Uh, and so those individuals are largely uninsured in Texas. Um, obviously, what you'll hear a lot of Republicans say is that's an incentive to get a job. Because if you work minimum wage uh, 40 hours a week, 50 weeks a year, you make 130% of the federal poverty level and you'd be eligible for all these subsidies. So that's a counter argument, but you're right that basically the people below 100, if they, if they are at that income level today, um, you know, they're priced out of the market. So here's just a chart. I, I won't dwell on this, but uh, people sometimes ask me, why is the ACA uh, health insurance so expensive? And the, the answer you often get because people read the paper is, well, it's because uh, the Affordable Care Act covers people with pre-existing conditions. And what this, what this table is trying to explain to you is that's not actually the case. It's not the coverage of pre-existing conditions that drives up the cost of health insurance for people in the Obamacare exchanges. It's a couple of other things that get a lot less attention. Most importantly is the fact that the ACA only allows you to charge younger people one-third of what you charge older people on the exchanges. It turns out that 64-year-olds spend about six times as much on health care or consume about six times as much on healthcare in a dollar, on a dollar basis than 19-year-olds or 26-year-olds. So in theory, in a, in a true market, your insurance should be six times more expensive if you're older or one-sixth as expensive if you're younger. But because the ACA compresses that to two to one, basically younger people's premiums doubled. So not only did younger people's premiums double, but because a lot of those individuals then just dropped out of the market, insurance got more expensive for everyone, which is the risk pool composition and adverse selection piece. So those were the biggest drivers of higher premiums in the exchanges, not pre-existing conditions. Can you explain why the ACA caused that compression? Why did, was that caused deliberately? Yeah, it was caused deliberately. So uh, there was actually a debate within the Obama administration. The economic team was, was opposed to this provision in the ACA. But the political team was for it, because the political team was worried that Obamacare wouldn't pass Congress. And they, uh, they understood, because they were political people, that, that older people vote and younger people don't. And that they could get the ACA to poll better if they included that provision in it. Uh, so it was put in purely for political reasons. And it worked. The bill did get passed. But it also worked in the sense that the policy consequences were totally predictable. Let's move on to Medicaid for a second, because, go ahead. That doesn't increase the cost. That just transfers who bears the cost. Younger people are bearing it rather than older people. So, you know, on a percentage basis, sure, younger people's premiums have gone up, and older people haven't gone up for as much, but that doesn't explain what you said you were explaining. So that's the risk, uh, the adverse selection uh, and risk pool composition piece. So imagine this, OK? So take your example. So you're arguing that, well, it, doesn't, it only redistributes the cost. It doesn't affect the overall cost. The older person pays less. The younger person pays more. But the overall spending is the same. Yeah, can you go back to the slide? Yeah, yeah, sure. So, so why did the higher one go up? That's, that's really the issue. So if you're a 27-year-old healthy male, your premiums go up, right, for what we just described. The older person goes down, and the, uh, the, the younger person goes up. But then what happens, a lot of those younger people are like, so you're asking me to pay $300 a month for health insurance when I haven't gone to the doctor once in the last five years? I'm out of here. I'd rather spend that on an Xbox. And then we call them irresponsible. We say, these irresponsible 20-somethings, what is it with kids these days? They don't want to spend $300 a month on health insurance. How irresponsible. When in fact, you know, it's actually an economically rational decision to say, I don't want to spend $3,600 a year on health insurance when I'm not going to use $3,600 of health care this year in all likelihood. So they drop out of the market. And then what happens? When the young people drop out of the market and the healthy people drop out of the market and the only people in the market are old people and sick people, guess what? The average cost per person is higher, right? Because it's all about the averages in insurance. Because the average cost per person is higher, that's what drives the premium higher because the insurance company has to basically determine the premium based on the average cost of the people who've signed up for insurance. And so if the only people signing up for insurance are people who are high utilizers of health care, the sick, the old, then your premiums go up. That's what's called adverse selection. And that's a huge problem. That's why the ACA has an individual mandate, to force those younger people back into the system, even though they're being ripped off. right? And they called it the individual responsibility provision. It's more like the politician irresponsibility provision, because <laughs> that's basically what you're doing, is saying, we're going to put, 
we're going to force healthy uninsured people to pay more so that sick uninsured people can pay a little less, well, what happens? The sick uninsured people sign up, the healthy uninsured people don't, right? If, if you really wanted to do this in a fair way, you'd say to all 330 million of us, let's all chip in so the uninsured can afford health insurance. Not target that or concentrate those costs on healthy uninsured people. That's what Obamacare did. And so the, why do they do that though? They did it that way because they wanted to reduce the price tag of the bill. Obama had said, I want this bill to cost less than a trillion dollars in the first 10 years. So they really focused on that number. So what better way to do that than to basically drive the cost through regulation than through direct spending, right? That's basically how the ACA's politics played out. You, you look like your head's hurting as I explain this. So if I didn't explain it well, uh, we can go through it again later. Um, let's talk about Medicaid for a minute. We, we, heard a, we heard a question about Medicaid. So uh, the, the implicit question is, look, why don't we just expand Medicaid? That could solve the problem in Texas, for example, of why so many people are insured. Here's the problem with Medicaid. Uh, Medicaid pays doctors a lot less than private insurers pay for the same care. Now maybe Medicaid is paying the right price and Medi uh, private insurance is paying the wrong price, but the point is there's a huge spread between what Medicaid pays doctors and what private insurance pays doctors. In a state like Texas, it's about a third. Uh, Medicaid pays about a third of what private insurers pay. So what that means is across specialties, if you call up a physician and say, I need a, on a doctor's appointment and you have private insurance, almost no doctors turn you down. They basically all say yes. So a low number or a, a low figure on this chart is good. On Medicare, an increasing number of doctors are turning patients away because they're saying, you know what? Medicare doesn't pay me as much as private insurance, so uh, I'm only going to take private insurance patients if I have a busy practice. Some busy practices don't take insurance at all. Right? Particularly for like psychiatry, for example, is one area where that's true. Now look at Medicaid. More and more physicians are, are not accepting Medicaid. So you have this piece of paper that says you have health insurance, and yes, if you have a stroke, you, you have a heart attack, you go to the hospital, they'll, they'll treat you, and that'll be paid for. So that's, you know, there is a financial value to Medicaid. But for that everyday medical need, particularly if you're low income, you have a chronic condition, you have high cholesterol, you have diabetes, doctors aren't seeing you. Your cancer is not getting diagnosed when, it's, when it first appears, but much, at a much later stage. And so what does that mean? That means that if, you, if your di cancer is diagnosed late rather than early, you die sooner. Uh, you might actually get, be able to be cured if it's, if it's caught early enough, but if it's already spread to the rest of your body, you have no chance. And so amazingly, people on Medicaid, health outcomes for people on Medicaid are no better than people who have no insurance at all. Not because we're not trying to do stuff, but because because of this problem, that you have health insurance, but you don't have access to everyday physician care. Go ahead. Are the differences in reimbursements proportionate to the difference in acceptance, or is it also an element of, yeah, we'll serve the old, but not the poor? Um, no, the, the, so if you look at uh, survey data, I mean, of course, there's no real scientific way. You have to just look at survey data to look at this. Um, uh, you, there aren't, no one's experimented on doctors to figure this out, but generally speaking, yes, the, the biggest correlator to the spread between acceptance of patients is reimbursement rates. Uh, a second thing that comes up in surveys, but it's a distant second, is that a, a lot of people on Medicaid will cancel appointments at the last minute or not show up for appointments. Um, and doctors really hate that because it's like, you know, a restaurant reservation at a hot restaurant, like that's money you could be making that it's totally disruptive of your day. Um, and because the Medicaid patient isn't paying for it, they don't care, right? There's no cost to them for not going to the appointment. Um, and, so, uh, and so that's the second thing you'll hear physicians say. But number one is, uh, is the reimbursement rate difference. So, okay, what about the, I've gone, all, I've gone this long without talking about Medicare for all or not really talking about Medicare for all. Medicare for all, from a political standpoint, is basically a waste of time. It's never going to happen it would cost $33 trillion over 10 years at the in terms of increased federal spending. Now, it would be replacing the private spending, so Bernie argues until he's blue in the face, that, well, net spending would stay the same, right? That's true, but imagine, the, like, think about the debates we've been having in Texas about property tax reform, right? About, you know, changing out this business tax or changing this, like, you can't do it, right? Because the people who are, who are uh, affected by that today know that there'd be an enormous disruption. So imagine this, let's say you live in California where there's a high state tax. 
And, and so Bernie's saying, well, actually, no, California will reduce their state taxes to compensate for the $33 trillion in new spending at the federal level. Do you think California is going to reduce their taxes that much? I mean, I wouldn't be confident that the California government was going to do that, right? So you're going to see a massive net increase in taxes. By the way, that would increase federal spending, total federal spending, by 71%. Not health care spending, total federal spending. Another way to think about this, Obamacare, as we talked about, increased, increases federal spending over the next uh, 10 years by about uh, $1.5 trillion. So we're talking about 20 times. Medicare for all, in terms of the transformation of the federal budget, would be 20x as disruptive as the ACA. So, you know, yes, it's very ambitious. Um, and there is nothing in, uh, in, in the Medicare for all bills that have been produced thus far that gives you any clarity on how, to, how they would actually try to reduce federal spending. You know, because of course, if you start to say how you'd reduce federal spending, oh yeah, here's how we'll do it. We'll cut what we pay doctors by half, you know, or we'll cut what we pay hospitals by half. Guess what happens? The doctors, you know, march on Washington and, and fight you tooth and nail, the hospitals, et cetera. So, you know, Bernie doesn't want to get anyone to be mad at him. So he's basically promising a free lunch and not talking about the cost control piece, which is very, very challenging for all of us. Behind the scenes, though, a different conversation is happening. Uh, the smart candidates on the Democratic side are leaving wiggle room for more incremental efforts, even though they might even say, look, in my dream, I'd love to have single payer. There's much more of a conversation about public options, increasing the ability of the government to regulate prices. Nancy Pelosi, in particular, is working hard behind the scenes to move Democrats away from uh, Medicare for all or, or what, uh, what uh, Bernie Sanders wants. <clears throat> and there's going to be a lot of other ways for Democrats in a 2020 election through ballot initiatives and the like to try to expand Medicaid or expand the role of government uh, uh, health insurance. And by the way, um, you're going to hear a lot more rhetoric about Medicare for all rather than less. Not because, I mean, there has been an ideological shift in the progressive movement. But more of it is being driven by something subtle that a lot of people don't realize, which is that the Democratic National Committee changed its rules such that uh, in the next election, in the next primary season, the superdelegates won't have a vote on the first ballot. Only the primary and caucus voters will vote on the first ballot, which means that the most progressive, most left-oriented uh, voters will be determining who the nominee is on the first ballot. So all the Democratic candidates know that, and so they know their rhetoric has to be more Medicare for all oriented, even if they themselves recognize that it's not going to happen. OK, so I've complained a lot. Uh, George Clooney's not impressed. Uh, what do I think we should do? Well, I'm going to go back to this chart. This is the chart I showed you in the beginning about, uh, about government spending on health care. And I mentioned that there are these two countries over here where government spending on health care is a fraction, less than half, in some cases, of what we spend. And yet, Singapore and Switzerland have achieved universal coverage with the best health outcomes in the advanced world. Well, how have they done that? Is there anything that we can learn from these uh, other countries? Let's take Switzerland first. Switzerland has a system in which only about 20, about now it's more like 30% of the Swiss get subsidized health insurance. So we subsidize health insurance for everybody here. Mitt Romney gets subsidized health insurance. Warren Buffett gets, we all pay taxes, so Warren Buffett can get government subsidized health insurance. How crazy is that? People making $500,000 a year get a massive tax break in the US to buy health insurance. Well, Switzerland doesn't do that. Switzerland only subsidizes health insurance for lower income individuals and the sick, much like the ACA exchanges, but for everyone. Imagine if the ACA exchanges were the only healthcare system there were. So if you're low income, all the way down to zero, the federal, you know, zero of income, you had, you got a free ride with your premiums. But as you went up the income scale, that assistance phased out. That's basically how Switzerland works. So it's not exactly like a libertarian utopia, but it's much more market oriented than America. Why? Because they subsidize far fewer people. They subsidize the people who really need the help and not anyone else. And there's no government insurance. There's no public option. It's all private insurers. What Switzerland does is they have actually a single payer system for catastrophic coverage. You get hit by a bus, you have a stroke, the government insurance program covers you. But for everything short of that, you get a health savings account, where a portion of what we would pay in Social Security, your FICA or payroll taxes, Singapore has a similar system, but 
a portion of that social security tax is routed into a health savings account that you control. And if you're lower income, you get a top up, a little extra subsidy for your HSA. And you can combine HSAs among your family members. So let's say your wife uh, has cancer or has a, has a knee replacement, needs some extra money in her HSA. Uh, you can, you as your relatives can, uh, can give your HSAs to her tax free to use. That system works incredibly well. Singapore has one quarter of the government spending that we have. And yet again, great outcome. So, you know, I hear a lot of people that, that the, as soon as I put up this slide, the question on everyone's mind is, well, wait a minute, these are small countries. Some people will say they're homogenous countries. Well, how can, we, how can we learn from these small homogenous countries? Well, first of all, let me just say on the homogenous point, Switzerland has four official languages, so does Singapore. Uh, these are both actually very highly diverse countries. Uh, what they don't have is they don't have a black underclass, which of course they don't, they don't have the legacy of slavery and segregation that we've had for a couple hundred years. Uh, and that's a particular problem in the U.S. Uh, that leads to a lot of our statistics being worse than other countries. Actually, if you, if you take descendants of slaves, uh, slaves out of our health statistics, we're pretty much similar to every other country. Uh, so that's a unique problem that deserves special consideration. Um, but so leaving that aside, what's actually s important about Switzerland and Singapore is how similar they are in the United States in this way. Americans want choice. Americans like private insurance. They like having private options for the delivery of care and the purchase of care. They want insurers to compete against each other. That's how Medicare Advantage works. That's how the employer-based system works. That's how Obamacare works. So in that important way, Switzerland and Singapore have systems that are much more compatible with what Americans want out of their healthcare system than all these other countries. Now, I'm not saying that if we have the Swiss system, we're all going to start hiking up mountains by foot and skiing down them with our gear. I mean, we're not going to do that, right? We're going to still eat potato chips and watch football. But, you know, our economic, the economic structure of our healthcare system could be a lot better than it is now. Maybe you're going to get to this, but if it's all private insurance, how do they solve the adverse selection problem? Mm. So, they, they, the way Switzerland solves this, they have a lot of the same regulations that Obamacare has. They solve it by having a much tougher individual mandate than Obamacare has. Um, now, I don't advocate that personally. I think you don't need an individual mandate. There are other ways to get to the same result, mainly by solving that age, that age band problem that I mentioned. If you make that five to one and you create other carrots for people to afford health insurance when they're young and healthy, you can get to the same outcome that Switzerland has. Right, because the one trick is that while well, we have to have, we like choice, the choice we can't allow is you choose not to have health insurance. Because if you're young and healthy, you have to buy it because it's the fact that it's a bad deal for you that finances the system. Well, it doesn't have to be that way, right? So it doesn't have to be that it's a bad deal for you, number one. Number two, uh, the system is more directly subsidized through subsidies for everybody. If it's, Whereas not, in our if it's not a bad deal for healthy people, then it's got to be expensive for sick people. That's the only way it gets paid for. Uh, not necessarily. So uh, there are two ways to make health insurance less expensive for the sick. One is to charge the healthy more directly in terms of their premiums. Another is to, is to use tax, general tax revenue to subsidize the cost. So everybody sort of. Exactly. So, this, so that, that's, that's a very important distinction because... Um, if all, and particularly in our system, which is more fragmented than the Swiss system, right? So in our system, as I mentioned before, we're asking the healthy uninsured people to pay higher premiums so the sick uninsured people pay lower. And that's only about 20% of the overall market or 15% of the overall market. What if we ask all of us as Americans to pay a little more in taxes to subsidize those sick people's costs? Then you wouldn't be putting all the costs on those healthier uninsured people. You'd be saying all of us would chip in a little bit. And that way, those healthy uninsured people do not have to pay excessively high premiums and do have an incentive to enroll. Uh, yes, over there on the far left, the blue shirt. How do you adjust That's John. Hi, John. How do you deal with all that? Okay, yeah, I'm going to get to that, so stay tuned. Next slide. My four step plan to save America. <laughs> a lot of wiring under the hood. Just like your iPhone, you know, looks simple on the outside and there's a lot of wiring under the hood. 
You know, think of this as like, this is like the iPhone and there's a lot of wiring under the hood underneath all these bullets. And we can get into as much detail as you want. But I boil it down into four steps. The first step is to strengthen individual insurance. If you want to have a market-based health insurance system, one which leverages choice and competition to not only to keep costs down, but to improve the quality and the customer service and the caring in the healthcare system. You've got to create a system where people are buying their own health insurance and choosing the kind of health insurance they want. Yes, you want some regulatory brackets around that, but broadly speaking, more people should be buying their own health insurance instead of having their employer at an HR bureaucrat and their employer buying it for them, or the government, a bureaucrat at the government buying it for them. Instead, people should be choosing the insurance they want. And if you do that, you can reduce premiums and expand choice through regulatory reform. And so this topic that's come up in a couple of the questions, how do you solve the problem of, the, of how you pay for the high cost people? You don't do it by making the healthy people pay more in the insurance market. You do it by making everyone pay more through taxes. So you basically substitute the regulatory piece for more spending on what's called reinsurance, which is basically a fancy term for high-risk pools. If you've heard Republicans talk about high-risk pools, reinsurance is basically a high-risk pool that's integrated into the existing insurance market where we say, okay, if, you're, if you have diabetes or you, you got hit by a bus, you had a motorcycle accident, you're a high-cost uh, patient within the insurance market, there's gonna be basically an, in, an insurance of insurance that's on top of that that basically takes those people out of the regular insurance market and pays for their health care directly. And when you do that, you make the premiums a lot lower for everyone else because you're not relying on those healthy people's premiums to go up to pay for the sick people. So when you say reinsurance, that's your version of Singaporean catastrophic It's It's uh, not exactly, it's, 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 well, it has some common elements. I mean, they're, they're not completely different. It's not exactly the same. Uh, it's not exactly the same concept, but it's not that dissimilar in the sense that the point is for people who are very, think about it this way. Why don't we buy car insurance? A healthy way to think about health insurance in general and the economic principle is compare it to car insurance. When you buy car insurance, you don't buy insurance to pay for your gasoline at Exxon, right? You pay for car insurance so that if your car's totaled or if it gets stolen, that $30,000, maybe $100,000 bill in your case uh, is paid for by the insurance depending on what kind of a car you have, right? So um, that, that's what you should think of health insurance being. That's the Singaporean model. Catastrophic insurance covers, uh, is, is meant to cover those catastrophic surprise bills that could bankrupt you. Reinsurance you can think about is actually not even really insurance at all. So for someone who's already sick, who has a pre-existing condition, has heart disease, has cancer, you know that they're going to spend more money. So in a sense, you're not insuring them against unpredictable catastrophic spending, you're ensuring that you're actually prepaying for predictable high spending on health care. And so reinsurance in many ways is trying to lop that piece off so that for everybody else who's basically healthy and is worried about what happens to me if I get hit by a bus, that's real insurance again for those individuals. So the concepts are complementary but not exactly the same if that makes sense. So that's the private market or, the, or that's the in individual market. Making the individual market the centerpiece, like it is in Switzerland in particular, is the key to having a more market-based system, where again, people choose their own insurance and have broad latitude in the kind of insurance they can buy, but not unlimited latitude. The next thing you have to do is you have to reduce the unit prices of healthcare. We talked about how hospital care, drug prices, everything, lab tests, the unit price is higher for the same amount of quality. You know, hospitals will charge you 100 bucks for a bottle of vitamins, for a bottle of Tylenol. You know, that you can get at the CVS or the Duane Reed or the Walgreens for like two bucks, right? Why is that? It's because of these perverse incentives that we've talked about. And there's a lot we can do here to reform the system, in particular, to reduce monopoly power through more uh, stronger enforcement of antitrust laws and through other things that we'll go into. Yeah. What, is, what are your thoughts on you know, reducing the power of insurance monopolies rather than just hospital monopolies as well? Yeah, so there's a couple. Insurance monopolies are slightly complicated, but the point stands. So why is it that we have insurance monopolies? We have insurance monopolies largely because we have hospital monopolies. So the hospital monopolies basically have control over an entire part of the country. 
Uh, to take one example, Northern California, there's a hospital system called Sutter in Northern California that basically owns the northern part of the state. And so if, you're, if, if there were 10 insurance companies, they have no bargaining power because Sutter can say to the insurer, well, you know what? Uh, if you don't like, we're going to jack up the prices of everything by 10% this year. If you don't like it, we won't take any of your patients. But we'll, send the, we'll, we'll, we'll take the insurance from your competitor. Right? And so the insurance company is then all of a sudden, well, we better just accept these rates because if we don't, we'll go out of business because no one will take our insurance because we won't have access to the Sutter hospitals, if that makes sense. So when the insurers are fragmented and the hospitals are monopolies, the insurers are under pressure to accept higher prices. So the monopoly, monopolization of the insurers is to counteract that. It's to level the playing field between the hospital monopoly and to have a monopoly on the insurer side so they have equal bargaining power. That's, in fact, the argument for single payer. The argument for single payer is, well, these hospital monopolies, the best way to fight them is for the government to slap them down and just say, you know what? We're the insurance company. Deal with it. You're not going to negotiate against us. Now, to flip that around, if you want to actually have more insurance competition in an organic way, in a market-based way, how do you achieve that? By breaking up the hospital monopolies so that, once again, a, 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 a competitive insurance market has an even chance to to innovate and to play those hospitals against each other on price and quality to improve, to lower premiums and improve the quality of their products. So the best way to have a more fragmented insurer market, I know I've made your head hurt, I'm sorry. If, the, the, best way to have a frag, the best way to have a fragmented insurance market is to have a fragmented market for hospitals. Oh no. I promise you that's not the case. So it may feel that way. It may feel that way because in a given state, you look around and you say, okay, Blue Cross has 80% of the market, right? Um, but in a, in, in a given region of the country where you live, like here, for example, there's basically St. David's and there's Seton's, and that's it, right? And that's true almost everywhere now, where one or two hospital systems controls the entire market. And so, you know, you're not... You know, it doesn't matter to you if a hospital in El Paso is competitive or not, because you're using the hospitals in Austin, right? So effectively, it, it doesn't feel that way, but effectively, the monopoly power of today is on the is on the um, is on the hospital side. And there's a lot of economic research around this. And if this topic really interests you, I encourage you to dig into it, and you'll 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 come away with the same uh, point of view, I think. So that's step two. We still have two more steps to go. So step three is Medicare and Medicaid reform. And by this, I don't mean the sort of traditional, what, you know, the Paul Ryan approach that we've, we've heard about for so many years. There are simple things you can do to make Medicare and Medicaid more affordable that doesn't involve uh, affecting what the average senior pays for Medicare and Medi uh, for Medicaid. In fact, you could actually lower what seniors pay in terms of premiums and co-pays if you actually make the cost of health care and the cost of delivering Medicare cheaper, right? So Medicare is expensive today. It's not as expensive as private insurance, but it's expensive today. A simple thing you can do, a third of, a third of people on Medicare are actually on Medicare Advantage, which is actually arguably more of a market than the employer-based system, because what happens in Medicare Advantage? If you sign up for the private insurance component of Medicare instead of the traditional single-payer component, uh, you choose among 10 or 100 different plans in your region that want to offer you health insurance. That's basically what I'm talking about, the Swiss model. Right? The Medicare Advantage is a lot like the Swiss model. Um, and, and one thing that's arbitrary about it is the government pays the insurers a fixed fee to basically administer the insurance benefit on Medicare's behalf. But why don't you just have the, medic the insurers compete against each other and say, you know what, I can cover this patient for 1000 bucks. No, I can cover this patient for 800 bucks, And let them fight it out and then base the price that the, gov the taxpayer pays on where the lowest bids come out. That gives the insurers an incentive to compete on price and become even more cost effective than they are today in a way that doesn't affect the senior at all, actually lowers their premiums. Go ahead. What if you had an auction for the Medicare Advantage and no one came? In other words, uh, right now I know that the companies that are really big into that, like Humana and Aetna, are in it because they actually are, make more profit from the Medicare Advantage oh, yeah. patients than they do from the regular Medicare. So I think if you got really competitive, they might just say, well, let's, let's just revert to the regular plan. 
Medicare. Well, yeah, no. So, so the insurers don't make more money on regular Medicare because they're not in medical. Medical regular Medicare is a government-run system where the government's paying its single payer. That's why Bernie calls his plan Medicare for all, which is ironic in a lot of ways because it would look totally, it would look nothing like Medicare, in, in in principle because a third of people on Medicare are actually on this private market-based system. They're not actually on single payer Medicare, and Bernie would abolish their plans. So I would actually take their Medicare plans away from them, ironically, <laughs> among other things. Um, but, but the point is, um, they do make more money in Medicare Advantage than they do on a lot of employer-based coverage because of this <laughs> weird thing where the taxpayer is on the hook for excess costs and they don't have to be. There's a lot of waste or fat in the way the government pays for Medicare Advantage. To, by making that system more competitive, you don't take profit out of the system. You still give the insurers an ability to make some money, but not as much as they're making now. Yes, it would be it'd be somewhat less profitable for them, but it would also be more competitive and they'd have more of an incentive to drive costs down in terms of the cost of hospital care, the cost of physician care, the cost of lab care, because all those things, you do that right, the premiums go down. So the insurers don't have to make less money under a competitive system, but all the underlying high prices, you start to, to whittle out of the system this way. And by the way, again, why are we all paying taxes so that Mitt Romney and Warren Buffett can have government subsidized health insurance. It's absolutely insane that in a, in, a, in a country where we're struggling to afford health insurance, we're asking people to pay higher taxes so that billionaires, millionaires and billionaires, as Bernie would say, can have government subsidized health insurance. So one of the things I've talked about is for the, the, the top 5% of America in terms of lifetime earnings when they turn 65, we should be telling them that, you know, you're gonna be able, you can afford your own health insurance, go buy your own health insurance. Don't ask the taxpayers, the rest of the country, to subsidize your health insurance. You should have saved enough over the course of your life, if you earn 10 million over the course of your life, to pay for your health insurance. You shouldn't be asking the rest of us to pay that for you. And by the way, we've talked about how Medicaid's health outcomes aren't that great because of the spread between what Medicaid pays and what private insurers pay. Well, why not have an integrated system in which those individuals who are able-bodied, who can work, can buy coverage on the exchanges, get the same deal that people who are just above the poverty line get. That would not only make the system simpler, but it would also make it a lot better and improve the health outcomes for these individuals. Why? A lot of people who are poor, their incomes go up and down. One month they're making uh, 1000 bucks, another month they're making 800 bucks, another month they're making 500 bucks, another month they might have an employer-based health plan. And they're having to switch in and out of all these different insurance programs with different doctor networks every single time their income goes up or down. And it's hard enough being poor in this country without having to switch your insurance plan every month. Think of all the bureaucracy that that involves. And that, is it any surprise that individuals in, on the margins are struggling uh, to get access to care? So if we had a simple system in which maybe your financial assistance might go up or down based on what, how much you were making, but your actual insurance plan wouldn't be taken away from you, you could do a lot to improve health outcomes and access to care for lower income Americans. And there are other things we can do too. We can uh, reform these outdated laws on um, anti-kickback uh, provisions in the federal law and privacy law so that you control your digital health records and technology entrepreneurs can help you utilize your health records to get the best possible care. Why not let veterans access the system? So veterans who are frustrated by the access to, to care and treatment they're getting in the VA system, let them take those dollars out and buy private insurance with them if they want to. And of course, let's tackle some of the other things we always talk about, like medical malpractice. We've modeled all this out, and if you do this set of reforms, if you enact the set of reforms, you would reduce the deficit over three decades by $8 trillion. You'd reduce federal spending by $10 trillion. You'd actually reduce tax revenues by $2 trillion. You'd make the Medicare trust fund permanently solvent. Every senior on Medicare today will live the rest of their lives knowing under this system that Medicare is fully paid for. Why? Because we kicked the ultra-rich off the program, and the savings from that are enough to pay for Medicare for everybody else. And because you reform the way Medicaid works, you have improved state fiscal stability. In Texas, like every other state, what we spend on Medicaid is the second biggest item in the budget, and sometimes the largest, next to public schools. And so the more we spend on Medicaid, the more we're squeezed in those other fiscal priorities. So the more we can reform Medicaid, the more states will have the flexibility to fund other things, like schools and roads and bridges and public safety. We cover 12 million more people than the ACA. Why? Because health insurance is less expensive. 
And when you make health insurance less expensive, it's amazing. More people will buy it because you reduce insurance premiums by at least 25%, possibly more under some of the new reforms that we're considering. And you improve, most importantly, health outcomes for the poor, those on Medicaid and those struggling to afford health insurance today, which is a key part of what makes this a bipartisan opportunity. You're reducing spending and increasing coverage at the same time. So let's talk a little bit about, some people ask me, okay, that's, so that's wonderful, you got all these pie in the sky ideas. Does anyone actually care in Washington about all these charts? And the answer is yes. Amazingly enough, we're actually seeing traction in Congress. Uh, this winter, a congressman from Indiana published a bill called the Hospital Competition Act of 2019, which does, it basically takes this chapter from our reference work on health reform and deploys and turns into a bill. It quadruples the Federal Trade Commission's budget to combat uh, hospital mergers and acquisitions. It incentivizes large hospitals to divest their satellites so that you can restore a competitive market. How does it do that? By barring hospital monopolies from charging more than Medicare. Today, the average hospital charges twice what Medicare pays if you're privately insured. That's why premiums are increasingly unsustainable for people with private insurance. Under this system, if you're a monopoly, you wouldn't be able to do that anymore. If you were in a competitive market, you'd be free to compete and charge whatever you want. But in a monopoly, if you want to remain a monopoly, we're going to regulate you like your local electric company. And in that way, you basically create a powerful incentive for hospitals to divest so instead of having St. David's North and St. David's North, maybe they split up and become freestanding independent hospitals, again, competing against each other for those patients. That should drive down costs and improve quality. Another congressman named Bruce Westerman has, has, uh, has decided to be even more ambitious. He does something very similar to the four-step plan I just described. He uh, tries to tackle, uh, he reduces private insurance premiums and taxes through some of the mechanisms I described. Same with Medicare and Medicaid. He reduces prescription drug prices through competition, through eliminating some of the artificial monopolies uh, that drive uh, uh, drug prices through the roof. And similarly, he borrows the Jim Banks bill for, for uh, reducing hospital costs and reforms uh, these uh, kickback laws and privacy laws to improve the quality of digital health. If you want to learn more about uh, what we're doing, our the 2016 version of our plan is called Transcending Obamacare. There's a new version that's coming out in the next couple of weeks called Affordable Health Care for Every Generation. That'll be on our website, freeop.org. And why do we call it that? Affordable Health Care for Every Generation. Because it's not just, we don't just want to have universal coverage for Americans living today. We want to have a system that's affordable for the generations yet to come. That's just as important as making sure that the system is affordable for the people in America today. And so that's what we're working on in healthcare. We also do work on education policy, on housing policy, and a lot of other areas. So uh, if you're more interested in our work, uh, check out our webpage. Come visit us in downtown Austin. And I look forward to your questions, if I haven't put you all to sleep. Thank you very much. All right, great. And I love that we had questions throughout, so hopefully that uh, we got to a lot, of, a lot of it, too. You know, I guess my big picture question would be that I've always believed that when things don't change politically, it's because of the forces of those that benefit from the status quo. Healthcare hasn't changed in decades. There's a lot of people invested in the current system. That's why things don't change. What are, you know, what, how, how does the political will emerge to take on these types of reforms you're describing? A great question, an important question. So I'm going to go back to a slide I have here, if I can find it, um, which is, where is it? I don't know where it is. Um, oh, here it is, this one. So. You know, when I, when, I, when I worked with this congressman from Indiana, Jim Banks, on that hospital competition bill, he, uh, you know, he said he wanted to work on hospital reform. And I said, this is great. Let's do it. So we, you know, he, he took this chapter and we, we went back and forth so that he could, he, you know, he got the technical advice he needed to turn this into legislative language. And as he was preparing to roll out the bill, I asked him, I said, you know, you know the hospitals are going to come after you 
most powerful lobby in the state, uh, hospitals in the average congressional district are the second largest employer after the public schools, you're, you're, you're going to get it from them. And he's like, you know what? Uh, I know that, but my voters care more about the high cost of hospital care than what they can do to fight in the other direction. And that's this point of this slide, right? That for the average voter, what they're spending on hospital costs, out of pocket or premiums, taxes, is more than what they're pending, spending paying to the IRS. So for the average family, this has gotten to a, a kind of a tipping point now where they care a lot about this issue. That's why single payer is more popular than it's ever been. And so hospitals, to your point, uh, don't have the political power to overwhelm the fact that this has become an increasing problem. And another way to pitch it, in a sense, to them, if, if for, 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 for uh, Congressman Banks is, listen, if you don't like what I'm pitching, you know, I can bring the senator from Vermont in and he can tell you what he wants to do. So, um, you know, I, I, think, I think a lot of people, a lot of people are starting to be aware that uh, the alternatives are worse. The alternatives are more um, uh, onerous uh, than, than something as relatively light touch as this, which is to tackle the problem of monopoly power. Yeah. Mm -hmm. uh, um, um, so my question, uh, um, can you hear me? Yeah, is that on? Okay. Um, so my question was on, so uh, you talked about like the cost of healthcare, and you talked about um, healthcare um, quality, right? Yeah. Um, um, how does the idea of overall health itself um, factor into this equation at all? Because if the overall population is healthier, then ideally you would be spending less on health care. Yeah, so great question, a uh, question I get a lot. So a couple things. Um, the first is that we all got to die of something. So whether we live to 80 or 100 or 120, we're all going to get sick. We're all going to need to go to the hospital for something. We're all going to spend money on health care. In fact, the countries that have the highest health expenditures are the countries where life expectancy in general are the longest, right? Because the longer you live, the more things are going to happen to you. Uh, health care is not only a consumer staple in the sense of a necessary daily need, but it's also a luxury good in the sense that the rich countries can afford to spend more on health care than poor countries can. It's in, uh, you know, so, so in countries, countries that basically where everyone dies at 30 of tuberculosis have less health care spending. Uh, than countries where people live to 100 and have Alzheimer's. So prevention does not actually reduce health care spending. It, it may improve public health, but we have to remember that improving public health is not the same thing as, uh, as reducing health care spending. Um, and, the, the, and that sort of gets, you know, that gets the other piece of it, that uh, from a quality standpoint, a lot of things that, that, that relate to health care outcomes, we've talked about some of them in terms of the way that insurance and the way it's designed can uh, reduce, reduce your access to primary care and thereby reduce quality. Uh, a big part of it, a big part of healthcare outcomes is not driven by the way health insurance works, <coughs> right? Actually, the biggest correlator to positive health outcomes isn't whether or not you have insurance. It's your educational attainment. So if you graduate from high school, you graduate from college, you've graduated from graduate school, as you go up that chain, health outcomes get better. Part of that may be income related. Part of that may be just if you're the kind of person who can slog through a PhD, you probably have a lot of the other uh, personal capacities to keep your health in, in reasonable shape, right? Uh, so it's important. This goes to the point about Switzerland and Singapore and everyone's saying, well, we're not, just because we have, you know, they're small countries, what can we learn from them? Um, you know, it's important to understand that health outcomes are not entirely driven by, uh, by insurance. And by the way, something about Singapore that's really amazing. When, when we were passing Medicare, Medicaid 1965, Singapore was founded as a modern country. At that time, the GDP per capita of Singapore was the same as the Congo. If you travel to Singapore, it's remarkable. The people who are 70 years old are like four and a half feet tall. The people who are 17 years old are six foot five. In two generations, Singapore went from one of the poorest countries in the world to one of the wealthiest. So when we say, oh, we can't be like Singapore, they're too rich, we're forgetting what's happened over the last 50 years in Singapore uh, and what's happened to us in the last 50 years.
as well. Hello. Um, Singapore, Switzerland, some of these other countries have very vigorous regulatory enforcement at, the, at their federal level. And I, I can see what you're, you're arguing for being very appealing to, to the center left, right? I, I would like to go and expand the, you know, the, the most powerful regulator um, uh, of the federal government to do more things and be more vigorous and be more resourced and all of those things. How do you convince a bunch of Republicans uh, to do that? Yeah. Um, great question. So it's, it's, uh, it takes some persuasion to convince Republicans, uh, some, particularly some, the certain, a certain kind of Republican, that we should have more antitrust enforcement. They see that as intrusive. Um, they see that uh, they're just, it's just, there's an instinct there that says, eh, I don't know about that. Um, and that's why it's so important to describe and to establish how much money you can save the taxpayer with a better regulatory structure. And we're continuing to develop those arguments. So I've shown you, obviously, I've, I've put you to death, put you to sleep with all the charts I've, I've thrown at you. We're working on actually more fiscal modeling to show that if you, if you did that thing on the, uh, in terms of capping the monopoly, hospital monopolies at Medicare rates, how much that measure alone would reduce federal spending and private spending on, on, on health insurance premiums and on hospital care. I think that's the way you get more Republicans, uh, the Republicans who have those hang-ups uh, uh, over the hump. But, but it's already happening, right? So uh, more and more this is happening. And, and the president uh, has played a role in this. So you, you think about what's happening on drug prices. Uh, before Trump was elected, the Republican position, the Democratic position was we support price controls. Uh, Medicare negotiating drug prices is basically a proxy for saying we want price controls. That was the Democratic position. The Republican position was we're against price controls and we don't have any other ideas, so we're for the status quo. And what we argued starting in 2016 is actually those aren't the only two options. There's a third option, which is to eliminate the role of artificial monopolies and have more competition. Where competition is allowed, like with generic drugs, it works pretty well in America. Let's do more of that. And then the president comes along and says, hey, I don't like high drug prices. I'm going to do something about this. And, his, and when he campaigned, he campaigned on those Democratic ideas because there weren't any other ideas for him to draw on, he thought. But in the intervening years since he's been president, I mean, basically the president's proposal on reducing drug prices that they published uh, last year, two-thirds of that came from our plan. Um, why? Because it's much more appealing to Republicans to say, I'm for com competition than I'm for price controls. And so similarly on the hospital side, we think a similar dynamic is evolving, where if the alternative is Medicare for all or, or price controls or single payer from the Democrats, and the price of, of monopoly uh, hospital care is going up and up and up in a way that's unsustainable, if you don't like this solution, you've got to come up with another one. So I know in Switzerland and um, Singapore, the government also says health plans have to cover certain things and it um, keeps covers pre-existing conditions and keeps people from getting kicked off. Your plan didn't really mention if you see that as an important regulatory thing to go forward is to is to keep the to keep a quality of plan um, level among all insurance companies and then let them compete within that. Is yes, that short, your the idea? The short answer is yes. Um, I would be more flexible on the edges than Obamacare. I think Obamacare goes a little over the skis, and regulates things too much in ways that are unnecessary. Um, uh, to take one example, maternity care. So Obamacare says all plans have to cover maternity care in the premium, uh, which means that because of also you have one-to-one -one gender rating where men and women are charged the same amount, uh, if you're a woman and you're 26 or you're in childbearing age, uh, the premium for men who are 26 goes up a lot more uh, than it would otherwise. Now, as a matter of fairness, we want women and men to pay the same premium. But we don't want to discourage men from signing up for health insurance. So how do you solve that? High-risk pools, reinsurance. By taking maternity care and not paying for it through the premium, but through taxpayer spending on reinsurance, the high-risk pool, right? So that's you know, one example. I could give you 100 like that where there are these subtle changes that you can make to basically solve some of these problems that an overregulated environment causes in terms of high premiums for low uh, for healthy people. Anyone else? Right 
All right. Thanks, everybody.